everyone who's watching or attending on Aqua Dulce campus, Woodland Hills, Porter Ranch, people listening online. We've got a couple girls named Siobhan and Nia watching in Houston, Texas today. We want to welcome them on our show and people from all over the world. I want you to look inside your bulletin for just a minute. Uh, there's uh, several things in there you just always need to read through there. And um, after church, when church is over, back here uh, behind this wall, I'm not even sure how to get behind there, there's, there's a room, there's a big room back there. And uh, if you are interested in going with us to Israel, uh, we just have a few seats left. If, you're, if you'd like to join us back there, we'll give you a, a little bit of, uh, more information on that. And then I don't know if you all listen to podcasts, but we have a podcast here called Godly Goosebumps. Everybody say Godly Goosebumps. You say, what in the world is Godly Goosebumps? Godly Goosebumps is a podcast where we tell stories of people's lives have, who have been changed by the power of God, stories that only God can orchestrate. And so if you have a story uh, where God miraculously turns your life around, send us that story. We might share it on that podcast. And uh, we just, it's just like I get goosebumps hearing about this story. And again, stories only God can orchestrate. And if you listen to podcasts, go to wherever you find that podcast and uh, log on and follow us there at Godly Goosebumps. As you look at the cover of your bulletin, we're in a new series called I'm Standing Up. Now, we have people here today. It's your first time to ever be here, just so you know. And uh, this is the last series of this year. Uh, when this series is over, it's Christmas. And so um, I just want you to know as we go through this that um, this has to do, this whole series has to do within a culture that is half crazy, that as believers, this is not the time for us to sit down and be quiet. This is the time for us to stand up and make a difference in our world. Amen. And so these, these eight messages uh, have to do, uh, if, as you read through every text, uh, somewhere in the text, it has the word stand. And so that's what we're looking at. Two weeks ago, I preached on standing in reverence, the story of Moses there in front of the burning bush, and the Lord said to Moses, take off your sandals for the ground that you're standing on is holy. We talked about how we are to stand in holiness and reverence before God. Last weekend, I preached on staying firm to the very end, the fact that one day the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and what should we do? Go hide, uh, put our head in the sand uh, like an ostrich, or should we stand firm and continue to do what God has called us to do till the very end. And so today, I'm gonna to speak to you on this subject called standing together. And everybody say the word unity. So we're gonna talk about that today. Now, I had to tell you a couple things. Some of you know this, but my knee, I've been fighting this bad knee for like 20 years. And uh, this week, next couple days, they're gonna chop, chop, chop and uh, I'm going to have a full knee replacement. And uh, I'm not looking forward to that, honestly. Uh, but I know I need to do it uh, because I wanna be around a long, long time, right? Uh, but I'm just not very mobile right now with that, with that, that bum knee. So, a couple of things. It means that I'm not going to be able to preach the next few weeks, and, and that's okay, but uh, I always schedule uh, weeks away because I think it's healthy for you and I think it's healthy for me, but this is kind of unexpected. So uh, next weekend, uh, Caleb Walden is gonna preach on what I think is probably the most, one of the most important sermons on this list, standing on the gospel, because the gospel's being watered down all over this country today. And Caleb's a young man, he's 25 years old, and you're gonna think, man, that's young. He is young, but he has spent every one of those 25 years here at this church. He literally grew up in this church. And this is the type... This is the type of young man that this church produces. When you've got godly parents like his mom and dad, Sean and Susie, and he grows up in a great church like this, this is how young people turn out right. And so be here next week to hear this incredible sermon. The week after that, we have a man named Scott Daniels. Everybody say Scott Daniels. I just want to tell you now, my, I have three children. My baby, my baby, my little girl. Oh. My youngest daughter, she married a guy named Noah. 
And Noah and Carrie, they're both fourth generation in ministry. So the man who's speaking next week is Noah's dad. This is my daughter's father-in-law. And there's a college up in uh, Boise, Idaho, uh, Nampa, Idaho, 18 miles outside of Boise, a Nazarene university. And that university has a church affiliated with the college. Scott Daniels is the pastor of that college church. He's also a professor at the university. He's a really, really smart guy. And my wife absolutely loves him. Drives me crazy. <laughs> but uh, he's just very, very insightful, and he'll preach. He's got his own style. It's, it's different than everybody else's style, but you will enjoy listening to him. And just know that, you know, the more I encourage them, the more chances I might get more grandchildren down the road. I, I know that sounds strange, but that's the plan. And then the week after that, just so you know, we have Bishop Kenneth Ulmer from Faithful Central Church is going to come and preach. And Bishop Ulmer's a friend that uh, he's retiring in February, and he's been at his church, Faithful Central, which is right down there by where the forum is in Inglewood. He's been there for 40 years and getting ready to retire. And I asked him if he'd come fill in because my knees, and he said, I'd love to come. So Bishop Ulmer will be here. And the goal, everybody say the goal. The goal, my goal is to be back and to finish up this series. That's the goal. So I need two things. One, one, I need you to pray for me. And number two, I want you to remember last week's sermon to be faithful. Because it doesn't matter who's preaching. You should never sit at home and go, I wonder who's preaching. You just need to get here and worship and know that God has a message for you. So be here each and every week. Amen, amen. That's what you can do for me. Now, Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And in your bulletin, again, there's some sermon notes. And I, you know, we put all that together every week. And I hope you'll follow along and take some good notes here today. We live in what's called the United States of America, but we have become the divided states of America. I want to ask you, and I want you to be honest, don't raise your hand unless you truly can answer this question. And this is a survey. We're taking several polls here today, just so you know. How many of you, honestly, you are frustrated with the division that's in our country, the United States of America? Raise your hand if you're frustrated by that. Now, if you don't have your hand raised, you don't read the news. <laughs> Everywhere you turn, there's political division, economic division, racial division, and moral division. And we're even divided in this church. You say, how do you know? Because I know. We'll do our own little poll here. How many of you, be honest, how many of you are UCLA fans? <laughs> Raise your hand. Mm -hmm, those are all the Christians right there. <laughs> and how many of you heathen USC fans are here? Those are all the heathens in the church right there. How many of you are cat lovers? Yeah, you should be going, meow. I don't know what's wrong with you people. <laughs> How many cat lovers, I mean dog lovers do we have? How many dog lovers? Mm -hmm. Okay, we got Popeye's chicken and Chick-fil-A. How many of you like Popeye's chicken? And how many Chick-fil-A people we got on? Look at you. All right, early risers and night owls. How many of you are early risers? You like getting up early? Yeah, you. You weren't here at 9 o'clock, and you even got an hour free last night. How many night owls do we have? Mm -hmm. I hope you're not married to each other. My last one. How many of you absolutely love preachers with a lot of hair? You like preachers with hair. 
And how many of you like bald preachers? Yeah. Eighteen fifty-eight. Abraham Lincoln was running for the United States Senate in the great state of Illinois against Stephen Douglas, and in one of seven debates, Lincoln quoted the words of Jesus. He said, "In Matthew twelve twenty-five, a house divided by itself cannot stand." If you have any Bible knowledge whatsoever, you know that the Bible teaches that Satan is the great divider. The word devil actually means to divide. The Bible says that the devil came to kill, steal, and to destroy. Anything that is good, anything that is holy, anything that is pure, anything that is of God, Satan comes to kill, steal, or to destroy. Besides, this is besides salvation, besides salvation, the greatest miracle is the birth of a baby. Yet Satan comes to kill, steal, or to destroy that baby. David Reagan, who leads Lamb and Lion Ministry, he was here yesterday for a funeral that we had for one of our church uh, staff, Rick Casel. David Reagan has this article, or Lamb and Lion did an article this uh, last month, recently published five things that Satan is doing to destroy America. Number one on that list was the breakdown of the nuclear family. Number two is abortion. Number three is confusion over sexual identity. Number four, emotional disorders. And number five is division. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, it lists seven things that God hates. Now, I know you know that the Bible says that God is love and God is a God of love, but the Bible says there are seven things that God hates. And one of those things on that list is a man who stirs up dissension. So Satan is the great divider, but God wants his people to be united. And that's why on the night before the crucifixion, the night before he goes to the cross, Jesus prayed for the church to be united. John chapter 17 that we're looking at is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Can you imagine listening in to Jesus as he prays? Well, you don't have to imagine because we have it written down. This is the prayer of Jesus the night before he's arrested and eventually goes to the cross. And what does he pray? Does he pray that his disciples would have more power? No. Does he pray that his disciples would have more wisdom? No. Does he pray that his disciples would have more money? No. What is his final prayer for his church, for his people? His final prayer is that they would be united, that they would be one. John chapter 20, John chapter 17, verse 20, 21, and 23, I'll put it on the screen. Jesus said, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, verse 21, that all of them may be one. And verse 23 says, may they be brought to complete, say the word complete. May they be brought to complete unity. That's Jesus' prayer the night before he goes to the cross. Point number one, write this down. Standing in unity is an answer to Jesus' longest prayer. His prayer that the church would be united. And the question is, are you an answer to Jesus' prayer? Are you united as a church? Are you, are you united as a people? Are you one with the body of Christ? Gordon Mel Melton is a Methodist minister with an unusual hobby. His hobby is researching denominations in the United States of America. And as of a few years ago, he had counted over 1,200 different denominations in our country. Jesus did not get arrested and was beaten and crucified, died on a cross, so he could start 1,200 different denominations. No. 
Jesus gave his life because he wanted people to believe in him and be united as one. And one day he's going to return. We talked about that last week. And when he returns, he's coming back for the church. And he's going to take us, and he's going to take us to heaven, praise God. But I want you to know that when you get to heaven, he's not going to put us in different gated communities based on how we worship down here on earth. There's not going to be a Presbyterian neighborhood. Over here, there's going to be a Methodist neighborhood. And over here's going to be a Baptist neighborhood. Over here's going to be a Church of Christ neighborhood. And over here's going to be a Pentecostal neighborhood. No, if you get to heaven, there's going to be one family, one gathering, one neighborhood. And you're going to be with a lot of people up there that you probably don't get along with down here on this earth. If you want to understand what unity is, you need to know what it is not. Number one, unity is not sameness. Some organizations need uniformity. That's why they wear uniforms. The military creates uniformity. The high school band creates uniformity. Churches make the mistake of confusing uniformity with unity. Uh, many people fall into the false narrative that every Christian should dress the same way, that every Christian should worship in the same way, that every Christian should follow the same translation of the Bible. I actually heard of a church down in Texas that if you get a, become a Christian at that church, they give you what they call a Christian haircut. <laughs> Unity is not uniformity. We have people sitting here today wearing clothes that they bought at Walmart sitting right next to people who wears clothes from Neiman Marcus. We have tattooed people sitting right next to people that have no tattoos. And we even have people that voted for Joe Biden sitting right next to people who voted for Donald Trump sitting right next to each other. We have blue collar people sitting next to white collar people sitting next to people who have no collar. <laughs> unity isn't sameness. Number two, unity is not made by human effort. Oh, I want you to get this. You can't by human effort make people united. It's something that only God can do. It's not something man does. This is one reason why the government will never be able to unite this country ever. Because only God can bring unity. Yeah. Have you ever seen this bumper sticker? Coexist. The C in that sticker represents the crescent of Islam, the nation Islam. The O is a peace symbol for pacifism. The E is a symbol for sexual rights. I want you to know that today that bumper sticker is politically incorrect because it represents only two sexes. Just wanted you to know. The X is the Star of David, which is, represents Judaism. The I is a pentagram, or what's called a Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, -C -C -A, a Wicca, which is a, something that represents a pagan way of life, a pagan cult or witchcraft. The S is, is called yin and yang, which is a symbol that represents Eastern religion and philosophy. And then at the end of that sign, they put a T for Christianity. It's ironic, if you study the history of this bumper sticker, it was created in the year 2000 by a Polish artist for an art show in Jerusalem. A few years later, some students from Indiana University stole it and claimed the copyrights. Later, Bono and U2 started wearing it, actually put it on one of their album covers. 
Then several fashion lines sued to obtain the copyright, and the poor Polish artist wasn't getting a dime off his creation. It's interesting that none of these fighting parties could coexist with each other. Finally, after years of contentious lawsuits and millions of dollars spent in legal fees, that Polish artist got the credit he deserved. The point being, unity is not unif uni unification. Everybody just getting along with everybody else. I'll, I'll say that no one can get along with everyone. Unity is something only God can bring. Number three on that list, unity is our shared union with Christ. That's where it comes from. It's brought about by the Holy Spirit of God. Man cannot create unity, but what we can do, this is biblical, we can keep the unity. You say, what are you talking about? Well, Ephesians 4 says these words, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit is what unites us. We need to try to keep that unity through the bond of peace. The Bible says there's only one body and one spirit. Several weeks ago, we had you fill out a survey. Several thousand of you filled this out. Several thousand of you did not fill it out. And it's okay. Uh, we wanted to have a record of, of really what, what this church is made up of from different walks of life. So the thousands that did fill it out, here were the results. Couple of slides, there are 70 different languages spoken in this congregation here today. Someone was mad at me last night. They, they grabbed me after church and said, we didn't sing that song in Farsi. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we can't sing all 70 of them. But you, you got the point that we have different people here that speak different languages. And the next slide says, in this church, from, the, from about half of you that filled out the survey, we have 137 different ethnicities in this room here today. Think about that. 137 different ethnicities. And the last slide I want to show you is, how did you find out about this? How did you get here? You know how we got here? The number one reason on the list is just a personal invite. Someone inviting somebody else. I mean, we, a few people drove by and saw the, saw the fireworks going off or social media. But most people got here today because someone offered a personal invitation. I don't know about you, but I love the diversity of this church. Don't you? Don't you? And what, what brings us together? What is it that actually unites us? It's the spirit of a living God. If you are a Christian, if you're a believer, and you get on a plane, you can travel to any country in the world, and even if you don't speak the language of where you travel to, if you meet someone in that country that also is a Christian, you have an immediate bond with that person. How is that possible? Well, it's the Spirit of God. If I go to China, and go to the western edge, not, not over there on the eastern where Beijing and uh, Shanghai. If I go to the western edge of China and I find a Chinese man in an underground church who's never even seen a Caucasian, and I were to meet that man, I would be closer to him than I am to a blood relative who is not a believer in Jesus Christ is true. If I go to Kenya and I meet a, a Kenyan Christian, I'm closer to my Kenyan brother than I am to my own sibling who's not following Jesus Christ. The spirit of a living God is what unites us. Number two, write this down. Standing in unity validates, everybody say the word validates. It gives proof that there actually is a triune God. Someone asked me last night, what's triune mean? It means tri, it means three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three different entities, but three in one. The, the Trinity, a triune God. And when we get together down here on earth, the Spirit of God unites us. It validates there must be a God. And that's what brings hope to a lost and broken world. Verse 21 reads, 
that all of them, Jesus prayed, that all of them may be one. Father, see he's talking to his father, so you've got, G, you've got God the Son, Jesus, talking to God the Father. And he says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you've given to me. He's talking to God. He's saying, God, the things that you've given to me, I've given to them that they may be one as we are one. As Jesus is one with God and God is one with Jesus, when we get saved, he puts that spirit in us and then he makes us one with God, he makes us one with Jesus, and he makes us one with one another. That's how it works. Now in Philippians chapter two, there's another verse that says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. I want everybody to say the word humility. In humility, consider others better than who? Better than who? Oh wait, I'm, I'm not reading this right. Yes, in humility, consider others. Because if, if you're prideful, you can't do this. But in humility, you can consider others as better than yourselves. Each one should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Don't you see that if the entire United States of America, if we all became Christians, and we became one with God and one with Jesus and he puts his spirit inside of us, that's the triune God, and wherever we go, we're united to each other, and then every person you meet, I don't care who they are, every single person you meet, you consider them better than yourself. Don't you see how if we just followed that one line in the Bible, that racism would cease to exist if we could only do that? Ultimately, our unity with God is what makes us united with each other and our obedience in consider, considering others' interest needs above our own is what brings hope to a world that is broken and lost. Our church sets an example, first of all, write this down, in our appearance, just in our appearance. Because if you go outside the walls of this church, you see hatred, and division, and you see no hope. There's no solutions. But if you walk in here today and you just look around at all the different people that are here and the 70 different languages that are spoken representing over 100 different ethnicities, you find hope. You don't see this in the world, but you see it here. That's the purpose of the church. And not just in our appearance, write this down. But it also is what enables us and gives us the ability to reach the world. Because right now, while you're sitting here, we, this church, this church, we have missionaries in Africa this very moment. We have missionaries in India this very moment. We have missionaries in Europe this very moment. We have missionaries in Asia this very moment. And don't you see, because we're different, yet we're united, we're able to make a difference in the nations of this world. In just a few weeks, it's gonna be Thanksgiving. We're gonna take up a Thanksgiving offering. Don't worry about it, we'll send you the envelopes. <laughs> and just so you know, we haven't taken up an offering here in like three years. We don't even pass offering plates. I don't even know how the lights are on, to be honest with you. You saw the staff. So people give faithfully online, and I thank you for that. But we're gonna take an extra offering on Thanksgiving because we're gonna, we do this Thanksgiving, we take up this offering, we give it to other nations of the world. And so one of the things that God's been bur burdening my heart is for the people of Somalia, because right today there are 250 million people who are dying, literally dying of starvation. So part of our Thanksgiving offering is gonna go to the people of Somalia. 
We'll also, uh, we, we'll, we'll, we, we join with a ministry called Convoy of Hope, and uh, they do work all over the world, and they, they recently sent me a video just to say thank you to you. And I just want you to see the connection of us being in here together, what an impact we can make around the world. Watch this video, it's three minutes long. Hi, this is Hal Donaldson of Convoy of Hope, coming to you from Ukraine. I just wanna say thank you to Pastor Dudley and all our friends at Shepherd Church. Thank you so much for your generosity and your partnership. Because of you, there are children, there are families right here in Ukraine who are receiving much needed help. To date, millions of meals and millions of dollars in emergency supplies have been distributed to both refugees and to families inside Ukraine. More than 200 large shipping containers filled with food, medical equipment, hygiene kits, sleeping bags, tents, and new clothes are being distributed. And more containers are on the way because with your help, Convoy of Hope has made a commitment to distribute 50 million meals. Currently, we're working through a network of churches to resource 20 distribution hubs in undisclosed locations inside Ukraine. Please know that the food and supplies you are providing is meeting urgent physical needs and opening the doors to share the love of Jesus. In one community where a church was doing distributions, we learned that there was a woman who had actually been attending the church for years. After seeing the church's generosity and their involvement in the community as this war continued to unfold, the Lord moved in her heart in such a powerful way that now she's not only attending church, but she's following Christ. She gave her heart to the Lord just as she watched the church serve the community and as she now has jumped in and become a part of the relief efforts. From warehouses in Poland and Romania, we're also serving refugees in nine neighboring countries. Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Moldova, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Austria, Germany, and Hungary. But because families continue to migrate west, we're expanding the relief effort to additional countries. Convoy of Hope is committed to working in the region long after the war is over, because families will need our help putting their lives back together. And to that end, we've put together a long-term strategy so that we can meet as many needs as possible. Our desire is really to position the local church to be the church that God has desired her to be, to be the hands and feet of who God is himself, to show his kindness to the people of Ukraine. We're committed to the long haul. We're committed for here for years. We're committed to the pastors and we're committed to the need. Many Ukrainians have expressed their deep appreciation for your support. As one refugee said, we will never forget that you came and you stayed and you helped us when we needed you the most. I'm truly, truly grateful that Convoy of Hope chose to come to Romania. You help in a big way. This food make long, uh, long life for people, you know. They not die because <laughs> they have food. Ми би без вас не вижили, направда. Ви дуже допомагаєте, це відчувається. I think there's millions of people that in Ukraine would have nothing to say but thank you. So the very fact that we're in here together, the world thinks there must be a God because who else could get all you people together? There must be a God. And together we can make a difference in the world. Can someone say amen? amen. Number three, write this down. We're, we're getting ready to close, but I have a few more minutes here. When we stand in unity, the end result is that it leads others to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And I wanna show you this next verse, and I don't want you to tune out, stay with me. We're way ahead of schedule, someone say praise the Lord. <laughs> but I, wanna, I want you to see this verse. This is the, the next verse, John 17, verse 23, but I want you to get this. Jesus says, his prayer, the next day he's gonna to go to the cross. May they be brought to complete unity. Why? Why? To let the rest of this world know. Know what? See, he's praying to his, he's praying to God. And he's saying, Lord, just like you and I are one, would you make them one? Because if they're united, then they'll 
be able to let the whole world know, know what? That you sent me. And not only have you sent me, the reason why you sent me is that you have loved them even as you've loved me. That's John 3.16. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, right before he goes to the cross, he knows what the cross is all about. He says, Lord, as I go, to, go through this ordeal, and as I die, and I'm buried, and I'm resurrected, and I ascend, may the church be one. Because if the church is united, then they will have a message. They'll be able to tell the rest of the world that you have sent me, that you have loved them, even as you have loved me. You see, you and I, we're saved. We know John 3.16. We know that God loves us. We know that our sins have been forgiven. But the world around us, there are literally millions of people in this city that do not know that Jesus loves them. There are millions of people around the world that have never heard of John 3.16. They don't know that God loves them. They don't know that God sent Jesus to die on a cross. But somehow, if we work together, and we serve together, and we do life together, and we worship together, somehow then we're able to reach the rest of the world and let the rest of the world know that not only does God love us, but God loves you. Not only has God forgiven us of our sins, God can forgive you of your sins. It's a win, win, win if only you and I can get together. Well, as we join our hands and our hearts and our lives, we show the world that we're not divided, that we're one, we're one family. We're closer than blood relatives in here today because God made you his son and God made you his daughter. Amen. Let me read this scripture to you. 1 Corinthians 12, just look at it quickly. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. Verse 13, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit. Praise the Lord. So years ago, this is back, this is back when I was single. This is like 250 years ago. Um, I had a friend... Uh, who was single as well. We hung out all the time. And he had in his living room, this is in his front room, he had a huge fish tank full of piranha. It was a piranha fish tank. And when you're single, you can do that. And one day he says, Dudley, do you want to see me feed the goldfish to the piranha? And I said, yeah, I want to see that. So he said, come with me. So we go into his kitchen, because I thought he was just going to do like, like fish food. We go into the refrigerator. He opens it up, and he takes out a Ziploc baggie full of water. And there's like three little goldfish in there. And they're like, they're not swimming around, they're just hanging, they're just chilling like a villain. He said, Dudley, come with me. We go into the living room. He unzips the baggie. He starts to, I said, wait, 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 wait. I went and got a chair and I pulled it up because I, I wanted my nose right on that. I wanted to see, I wanted to see. And don't be upset, you've all seen Lion King. There's just something that happens out there. So I'm right there against the glass, huge tank, huge piranha. He unzips that little thing. He pours the entire contents, water and the fish, go in there. What happened next, I will never forget. It has stayed with me all the years of my life. The second, the nanosecond, that those goldfish broke the surface of that water, They swam as far away as they could from the piranha. I mean, they were in this little bag just going. 
in the refrigerator. It was nice and cool in there. They were comfortable. He pours them in. The second they break the surface of the wall, they go clear to the other end of the fish tank. And I watch like Jaws. Little goldfish hanging over in the corner. And I watch. I saw it with my own eyes. The piranha went over there and just swallowed him up. And God taught me something that day. And what he taught me was somehow in his genius, God put an inst there's an there's an innate instinct inside of every, a little tiny goldfish that that goldfish knew instinctively the second he got into enemy territory, enemy water, he knew he was in a bad situation and got as far away that he could. And if God put that instinct in a goldfish, how much more did he put that instinct inside of a human being? Which means this, that when a person of color walks through these doors, it doesn't take them 10 minutes or 20 minutes or they got to sit through the whole service to know if they're welcome here. The, nan the nanosecond someone walks in these doors, they know instinctively if they're in enemy territory or friendly waters. God put that ability in each of us. And that's why, stay with me, you look down every row in this church just take a look. There's an African-American person. There's a Caucasian person. There's a Latino person. There's a, someone from the Middle East on every row. So that, so that, when somebody walks in here, they don't have to wait to the sermon or to the, they just, they just look around like that. They know they're welcome here. And Revelation, Revelation chapter seven, here it is. God gave John a glimpse of what heaven's gonna look like. He said, John, write this down. John said, after I looked and there before me, he's looking at heaven, there before me was a great multitude, so many people I couldn't even count them all. And they were from every nation, they were from every tribe, they were from every people and every language and what were they doing? All these people in heaven, they were standing before the throne next to each other and in front of the Lamb. And the next verse says, down to verse 10 it says, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, and they worship in heaven forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Today in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, 11 o'clock, it's still the most segregated hour of the week. And that's not what God intended. God intended, his intention was that the church would be a glimpse of what heaven looks like. And I praise God that when someone walks in here and looks around and sees all these people worshiping together, over a hundred different ethnicities and you're in here sitting together and getting your worship on, that it's a glimpse of what it's gonna be like in heaven. A lot of people gonna, a lot of people gonna get up there and they're gonna get up to worship Jesus and go, oh, who let you in? But not people at Shepherd Church. We're gonna say, well, this way we worship every Sunday down there. Let's get your worship on. Forget about who's next to you. Let's just focus on the lamb. Amen. I just saw Dr. David Reagan. Dr. Reagan, would you stand for just a second? Would you stand? This is Dr. Reagan. He's the one that runs Lamb and Lion Ministry. You need to check that out. And uh, he said, Jane, stand up. Jane's husband died. He's on our staff, uh, Rick Casel, one of the greatest people. And uh, you pray for her. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. You should have just remained standing, Dr. Reagan. That's one of the greatest preachers who've ever lived sitting in this room over here. And his knees are probably better than mine, right? <laughs> How many of you glad you came to church today? All right. 
Get out of here. here we're going to have the Holy Land meeting if you want to go. When church is over, go find your African-American brother, your Latino brother, your Asian brother, your Filipino brother, and just say, you got to come to church with me. We'll show you what heaven's going to be like. Let's pray. God, thank you for today, and thank you for this series, Standing in Unity. And just now, like we're standing right here, we're going to be standing up in heaven from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Thank you, God, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for a church like this. And this is gonna sound bad, some people are gonna take this wrong. There's some churches I don't even like walking into today. Because instinctively, I don't know if I'm welcome or not. But here, oh, I walk in here, it's like, this is heaven. So help us to realize that the Spirit of God that unites us, enables us to praise, that the more of that that we do here on this earth and the more people that we can get to join us, the more the people are gonna be up there in heaven doing it. So help us to realize we're a part of that process. And may Jesus' prayer be answered by those of us who are here. Help us to truly be one with one another as Jesus is one with God and God is one with Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you and thank you for coming to church today.